So, you know, if you look at, if you look at how well financials have done and what are auto companies, I mean, they're essentially a bank with, you know, that's attached to a, to a manufacturing plot. Um, and so I, yeah, I mean, certain autos I like, not Tesla, um, not buy Ferrari or some of those things, but it, you know, if it, on a stock pickers thing, you can dig in and you can find the jewels, just trying to find the good stuff. Well, I love having my conversations with Sean Pesh of Ranmore Funds. You never really know what's going to come up next, uh, whether Sean's going to talk about performance fees or indeed those surprises that we ended last year on. We're going to be looking at some of the surprises and how they have worked out. In other words, Sean's crystal ball. But then there's um, there's a few stocks that we missed that we should have been buying or that Sean told us to. And uh, then we'll also um, look at his recent piece that he wrote on capital gains, why it should not stop you from making the action if you feel that a stock should be sold. Uh, Sean's coming up. He's with Randmore Funds. Yeah, Sean, I'm sure there's going to be something unusual. There always is when uh, we have our conversation. How are things going in the UK? I mean, we from the sound of it, and nowadays in this in this remote world, one wouldn't know where one's based unless you you actually point it out. But you've been in the UK now for some years. I have, Alec, for um, going on 22 years now. So um, you can't tell from my accent. So my my UK colleagues and friends remind me. But um, that's great. And and but looking forward to Biz News Conference next week coming out of South Africa. So it's been cold and wet and miserable here, um, as you can probably tell from the colour of my skin. So looking forward to getting a bit of sun on my my back in South Africa. Good news for you is that you get electricity 24 hours a day. We now down to 14 hours a day. Oh, Our blackouts have now gone up to 10 hours a day, Sean. It's, uh, I, I refuse to call them load shedding anymore. That's off the table. We've got to start learning um, as, as when Richard Quest was here. He says, what's this, this cutesy word that you guys have invented called load shedding? Blackouts. It's, I mean, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a, I did a tweet a little while ago because I looked into what the, the, the sources of demand are for South Africa's electricity and a huge percentage, I think 28% was to petrochemical and refining and 13% was to iron and steel and only 7% to residential. And I mean, this is time for, uh, for out the box thinking. So if I think if I were running the show, I'd say, listen, I'll tell you what, we shut down the iron and steel industry. Okay, we import the iron and steel that we need for now. And we let the lights stay on at everybody's houses. I mean, you know, that's iron and steel industry uses twice the electricity of residential. And and why wouldn't you do that? But anyway, you know, I'm, I'm not, not sure that that's just S, that's just uh, Oslo and Motel. I've got a feeling that's also the smelters. Definitely. That, uh, that, yeah. that uh, what's it, BHP Billiton have got hillside smelters, the aluminium yeah. smelters, which. Back in the day when electricity was cheap, they went and signed these long-term contracts. But you can't, you can't just break the contracts, I guess. Well, force anyway. majeure, Alec. What about the contract force with majeure. the South African public? Good point. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Well, there right. we go. Anyway, You're on it again. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not performance fees, it's BHP bulletin. <laughs> but uh, those surprises anyway. that you spoke about last year, and, and you did say that you were looking into a bit of a crystal ball, and these are the things that – it might happen that people weren't looking, uh, or weren't factoring into their potential uh, investment scenarios. First one: Russia retreats from UK Ukraine first quarter twenty twenty three. That's not looking likely at the moment, is it? No, we still got a month. But the Let's meat, see. yeah, it, it's been described as uh, as the Russian meat grinder strategy. Isn't that awful? Where they awful. just throw people at the awful. front lines. Anyway. Uh, the second one where you are, where it is a win, where you were talking about European energy prices falling. Yeah, look, those have, those have come down a lot. In fact, I think last week, 60% um, of the UK, there was a storm, was it Storm Olga or something? 60% uh, of the UK's energy was produced by wind. And it's been pretty mild. Friends I know who've just been skiing. There was no snow last week. The, it was 11 degrees at the top of the mountain. You know, they're sitting there at these uh, ski chalets. And, uh, and so it's been quite mild and prices have pulled back. And so it often happens that, that when situations unfold, people think that the status quo is going to happen, is, is going to occur forever. And that's what we saw late last year. And if you can just look beyond that, 
and say, well, is this short term in nature? Is it likely to be short term in nature? Then maybe there's an opportunity. And um, I didn't think that energy prices would come back quite to the extent that they have. Uh, but it just shows you that when you get a combination of you know, ingenuity and luck with the weather, um, you know, those, the, the German, Germany is an amazing country and those people are very innovative and they're full of engineers. And so you look at what they've done on the LNG imports, couple that with some warm weather and all of a sudden that they've weaned themselves off Russian gas. So they've outfoxed Mr. Putin. They no longer need him. And mm. uh, good for them. And, and so, big, you know, big, big moves like that, Sean, uh, impact the investment portfolio or the investment they, scenario. They do. You know, we had, I mean, we did very well on some, uh, late last year you had some, and you mentioned Associated British Foods. I mean, it was a UK retail and people were throwing babies out of the bathwater because it was, you know, energy prices were up, mortgage rates were up. People thought, well, UK consumers not going to ever shop again. That was almost what was priced into some of these companies. Well, of course, that's not true. Um, and so, you know, when when I mean, we've learned, we know the rule. When others, uh, when when um, be greedy, when others are fearful. And so, it was time to be greedy. So sorry, we didn't put Associated British Foods into the business portfolio. There are a couple of others that you told us about that we missed, but we won't miss the next one, Sean. We won't miss the next one. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, get them all right, Alec. Remember that. <laughs> US mega caps. You yes. were very, you were spot on with that. Uh, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, uh, that they had fallen sharply in December. Tesla in particular really yeah. fell out a bit. But then we had January. We had the January jump. So what's happening there? Well, look, I think there's a lot of guessing going on. You see, what happened is, is those large cap tech companies fell when interest rates started rising. And the reason for that is if, if you think Amazon's going to give you $100 of earnings 10 years out, and there's no inflation and interest rates are low, well, those $100 of earnings are worth $100 in today's money. But if, as soon as inflation starts rising and interest rates start rising, that $100 10 years out is no longer worth $100, okay? So what investors have started doing is saying, okay, what we need to do is we need to guess interest rates. Well, how do we guess? Because that is that is the answer. This is what I think is going on. That is the answer to technology. So how do we guess interest rates? We need to guess inflation. So everybody's focused on inflation and CPI and PPI and what the Fed's. I mean, there was even a comment the other day as to looking at Jerome Powell's body language and how his body was positioned in the chair when he was being interviewed. You know, and people were reading stuff into is he nervous? Is he, you know, does he look on edge, etc.? It's just crazy stuff. Okay. And so with in, with CPI having slowed down because many of the things, gasoline prices and food prices and fertilizer prices, and things like that have pulled back. Uh, people have said, right, that's the answer. You know, interest rates are going to start coming off. Let's go for the tech. But I think, I think they're missing the point. And, and I think the truth is that earnings for technology companies are falling. I mean, you know, you've seen these large companies, Microsoft's operating income was down 8%. EPS fell 6%. Um, Google operating income down 17, earnings down 18. You know, I can go on. Meta 49% down, EPS down 52. And revenue growth was either 1% or 2% or down. And so that's the truth. It's a bit like we've got six nations going on at the moment. It's a bit like watching, wait, watching the back line, thinking that the fullback is going to intersect and there's going to be some move in the back line. And then the scrum off runs around and dots the ball on the blind side. And that's so everyone's watching the back line, which is CPI. The truth is the the fly the, the scrum half's about to uh, dot the ball on the on the try line. So yeah, so those stocks have rallied um, sharply, but you know that's fine. I'm I'm not changing that surprise. I can tell you that you know for certain. And are you still of the opinion that value will outperform growth this year? Yeah, I think so. It's. Um, it is, you know, it's early days. The world index, just some numbers here, the world index is up seven. Value's only up 3.8, okay? Growth's up 10 and quality's up six. Now, you know, if you can be a stock picker, that's the, that is the broader index. But let's just, let's just look at that. Large cap value is up 2.8, okay? I mentioned value's up 3.8. Large cap is only up 2.8. Small cap value's up 8.4. So that's the interesting thing. And if you're a stock picker and, can, and find the jewels in there, well, you can be up more. You know, so we're up a bit more than, than those numbers year to date. Um, and, and I think the interesting thing is that MSCI World Value Index, North American exposure is 71%. Japan's only 6% and the rest of the world's 23 
Now, North America is up nearly 7%, but Europe's up 9 And European financials are up 12 So this really is a stock picker's market. Mm. I think it really is a stock picker's market. Let's just dwell a little on Japan. We have now yeah. put it into our business uh, model portfolios in both of them, uh, both the Shift portfolio and the Web Trader portfolio. So there have been a few people saying recent developments in Japan are very negative for the country. You're quite bullish on Japan. You remaining so? Yeah, very much so. We've, in fact, how about this, Alec? We've got more, equi- more exposed to Japanese equities than American equities right now. And I can't think of a time when we've, that's been the case. Okay, and um, you know, to give you a perfect example, actually, Caterpillar and Komatsu. Um, you know, Caterpillar. Just some notes here. So, so Komatsu grew revenue twenty. They're the number two construction company after Caterpillar. They all make those that big yellow equipment. Revenue is up twenty three percent. Okay, and it's on ten times earnings. Uh, Caterpillar up ten percent. It's on eighteen times earnings. And so you've got you've got the same exposure to uh, you know, construction, non-residential construction, and you think in the US you've got the Chips Act and you've got the in- Inflation Act, and there's a lot of building and construction going on. Um, you know, you've got these mega factories and giga factories in here in Europe. You've got people are trying to dis companies are trying to disintermediate China. They want to bring onshoring. We're building factories locally, so you've got exposure to those kinds of trends where you can buy it via Caterpillar and 18 times earnings or Japanese company Komatsu on 10. And, and so you see that. So I think, you know, we stock pickers, we invest on the bottom up. And if you look at the underlying fundamentals, things are going well in, for, for many companies, not all companies. And that's why I'm not a, such a fan of, of passive funds because with passive funds, you get the good, the bad and the ugly. You know, we're just trying to find the good. And, and you've made that point before. In fact, I uh, asked uh, another one of, the, uh, of our informal panel of investment experts, of which you are a member, uh, where to be putting our money if we are uh, not to throw it all into the, the value ETF, for instance, which, as you've made the point a few times, is not exactly value stocks. And um, Mark Perchtold from OMD, uh, OMBA rather, said, you should be looking at things like European autos, which in his opinion is very cheap. From your perspective, you would go even one deeper into the actual stocks, stocks like Komatsu, as, as, uh, as you've now pointed out. That's correct, Alec. And, and I agree with Mark. I know Mark. He's a friend of mine. He's a good guy. Um, and I agree with him on those autos. Now, just to give you an example, I mean, Tesla is one of the biggest winners here today. It's up, what, 69%. Interestingly, if I look at the World Index, Number eight on that list is Renault. It's up 35% year to date. Okay, it's up 50% since we spoke about it, I think, at the, at the Biz News conference. Now, now Tesla's revenue was up at 37% in the latest quarter, and earnings were up 41%, but it's on 50 times earnings. Okay, Renault's revenue was only up 11, but earnings were up 61. So actually, rev, reven, uh, Renault's rev, uh, earnings per share grew faster than Tesla. Now, this is only for the latest reported period. But 40% of Renault sales are EV and hybrid, and they've got a record order book, okay? And their growing operating margin, it's on five times earnings. So, you know, if you look at, if you look at how well financials have done and what are auto companies, I mean, they're essentially a bank with, you know, that's attached to a, to a manufacturing plot. Um, and so, I, yeah, I mean, certain autos I like, not Tesla, um, not buy Ferrari or some of those things. But, you know, if, if, on a stock pickers, thing, you can dig in and you can find the jewels. I'm just trying to find the good stuff. So Komatsu is one for our, our list. What? Renault is one for our list as well. Alec, you know, I can't give advice. I'm an active manager. So if Renault was to go up 50% tomorrow and some other companies would fall, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar, I'd probably be taking some profits. I mean, that's what, you know, we're an active manager. I Interestingly, you know, there are two ways to... Uh, to, to well, there's, there's more than two ways, but but you can get you can try and find the next jewel and the next Amazon, the next Apple, and hold it forever. Okay, I don't do that because trying to find the next Apple is really hard. You could have thought you could have thought Nokia was the next Apple. You could have thought BlackBerry was the next Apple and been wrong. Um, or what you can do is you can find those companies that you think are underpriced, and when they fully uh, fully valued in your view, you take your profits and you find and you reinvest it elsewhere. And so you compound that way. 
And that's what I do. Um, so I can't give anybody advice. I don't know what anyone's you know, portfolios are like, et cetera. All I can say is we have, um, I mean, we have nearly, what, 45, 50 companies or so in our portfolio. And the average position is just over 2%, 2.5%. And so right now we're happy with that position. But I would hate for anybody to take one of these ideas and think, oh, well, Sean got ABF right. You know, he's going to get Komatsu right and put their entire pension in it. You know, that is not what we do. So, um, you know, we have Renault and we have Komatsu in the portfolio and lots of others. Um, but, um, you know, it's a balanced portfolio, we think. That's a very good point, that one. And anybody who's read one of my favorite investing books, Engines That Move Markets by Alice Dare Nairn, uh, would know that the point you make of trying to find the next apple is a fool's errand. What he does in that book is he, he takes all the big new ideas, all the big ideas from uh, telegraphs and railroads through to the internet. And in all of those, he says, to pick the winners is just about impossible because you there are so many companies that are involved in that process. Even, for instance, if you bought AT&T, Alexander Graham Bell's company, at the wrong time, you would not have made money out of it or yeah. you would have underperformed the market. So picking the winners is difficult. Your strategy or your approach, as I think you've, you've outlined to us many times and now reiterated, is that you look for value mismatches where, like Warren Buffett says, if something, if you're getting 60 cents on the dollar, well, then that's a good investment. Um, whereas most investors try to get uh, 150 cents on a dollar that's already valued at 120. Absolutely, Alec. It's a bit like cricket. You know, if you go out and you try and hit sixes off every ball, you're going to get bowled. You know, you want to try and hit ones and twos and odd six. And that's how you win matches. Um, so that's what we try and do. Brilliant. Well, we have spoken about Japan. We um, haven't spoken yet about value beating growth for the rest of the year. There are some people who saw the January jump and said, well, growth stocks have been hammered for a year and a half. This is the end. They are now Sure, there wasn't capitulation, that usual ringing of the bell at the bottom. But they're now going to be uh, outperforming into the future. In a nutshell, what is wrong with that argument? Well, I think the problem is if you just look at those companies, especially those large guys, okay, that I mentioned, all the tech companies, they're all eating each other's lunch. And uh, and the latest one, you know, the latest one is Microsoft's trying to eat Google's lunch with this chat GPT. And if you think, you know, Amazon's in advertising, well, it used to be Google's domain. And, and Meta's domain. Um, and, and then Google moved into cloud or Alphabet moved into cloud, which was Microsoft and Amazon's domain. So they've all moved into each other and, and Alphabet moved into, you know, sort of pixel, which try and capture some of the market share from, from Apple. So they're all eating each other's lunch because growth is so hard to come by. And, uh, and chat GPT is the latest. And what did Sand, Sandar Pichai say? He said, he said, the search, the margin in search is over. Forever. Okay. Now, I don't want to bet against that guy. So why do I want to get involved in a fight with two heavyweight boxers? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a referee with Klitschko and Fury. Um, and I wrote a LinkedIn post about that the other day. So that is the problem that I see. And, and then you've got regulators getting involved as well. So why do I need to go and play there when I can find these little Japanese jewels and these little European jewels that are growing you know, and, and the Renos and all those guys who are growing earnings and they're not going to get a big fight. So so that's rather my approach. Sean, let's close off with capital gains. Yeah. And give us some insight into the piece that you wrote saying that you shouldn't, many people don't like selling because they're scared of paying the tax on capital gains. You've got a different approach. Yeah, my approach, Alec, is quite simple. You know, there's, there's a bit of an arbitrage um, that has been, uh, people have been able to take advantage of and still can in many places in the world because if it's income tax it's often at a higher rate than capital gains tax and and i just think that to make a decision purely for tax is short-sighted because that capital gains tax rate can increase and and it, if you look at the government debt loads out there it wouldn't surprise me if they do um, and and so i think one you know right if you what don't want to take profits because you think, well, I'm not going to, to sell and I'll have to pay capital gains tax of whatever the number is. I think the marginal rate in South Africa is 18%. That's the maximum you will pay. Well, focus on the 82% you get to keep rather than the 18% you get to pay. 
And, uh, and if you focus on that, then maybe the decision's a little easier because it would be terrible not to take advantage, pay the 18%. Then the, the investment falls, okay? And then you get, caught, of course, then you get caught in a whole psychological loop where you think, well, I should have sold then, but I didn't, so I can't sell now. And then capital gains tax goes up. And before you know it, the gains are whittled away and then the capital, and then the rate goes up. So I would just say, you know, just, 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 just focus on the 82% you pay, that you get, sorry, that you get to keep. Um, and you know what? Governments out there, they could do with some money as long as they're not, they're not using it corruptly, fix the roads and you know, pay for the healthcare and pay our nurses and all the rest. So I just think it's, it's quite refreshing not to worry about this whole, you know, how much tax you're going to pay. It's, uh, it's miscited and, and you're likely to pay more in the long term would be my suggestion. A rational insight from Sean Pesh, uh, the founder and portfolio manager at Randmore Funds. We'll be seeing him at the end of the month in the Drakensberg, BNC5. Sean can't wait. It's uh, it's an incredible lineup this time around. And uh, you're going to be participating in a panel discussion with Pete Fulion and Sa Jacobs. Fireworks or do you go- think you guys are going to ag- agree on most things? Hey, super guys, I'm sure we get on fabulously, Alec. We'll have a good debate and the, the winner will be the participants, the, the, you know, the attendees. Brilliant. Look forward to seeing you, Sean Pesh. You too, and Alec. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.